Welcome to episode 482. This week, artificial intelligence is now offering very questionable ethical advice. Phil wonders what it means for self-driving cars. Then two seminaries are suing the government over the COVID vaccine mandate. But is it really an issue of religious liberty? Then new data says that white evangelicals are the most likely to use violence to defend America, and at the same time those most likely to reject America's founding ideal of pluralism. Does anyone else see the contradiction here? Then I talked to John Mark Homer about his new book, Live No Lies, Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies that Sabotage Your Peace. He talks about the reality of spiritual warfare, although it's not what we've been told, the reason why information alone doesn't ultimately transform our lives, and then what is the role of our imaginations as we seek to follow Christ. All of that, plus more fascinating things about wombats. Here's episode 482. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. This is Phil Vischer. I am here with three delightful people in three delightful locations. Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. Phoning in from South Wheaton, Illinois. Um, Christian Taylor. Hi, Christian. Hi. I didn't hear you. Oh, there you are. Okay. That's quite a delay. That was quite a delay. Oh, great. Phoning in from somewhere in Kansas, where apparently the internet is draining like the aquifer. And if that's a Kansas joke that they will get. And Jason Rugg, who's phoning in from the Aurora. Sweet, yeah. sweet potato. What's the place? Sugar, sweet. Sugar Grove. <laughs> sweet potato. Sweet potato, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I no, I, I'm actually in Aurora. So you're actually in I, Aurora. Yeah, actually, actually in Aurora. That's fantastic. And Christian, we we were having technical difficulties. Christians in okay, Atchison, talk to Kansas. Us. Atchison, Kansas. Okay, you talked. You we saw your lips move, and the sound came out at the same time. So that's very <laughs> encouraging. So maybe we can do a show before anything breaks. Let's do the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Okay, Christian. You're yeah. in Kansas. You're in Kansas visiting. I'm in Kansas visiting my second son, Jacob. Jacob is a lacrosse coach working at Benedictine College. And, you know, there's not a lot to do here in Atchison, Kansas. And I got to no. tell you, I didn't believe him. I thought he was complaining. And like, he's kind of shy when he was little. He would, I would send him down to play with the Ebels, who's a friend of ours, and he would hide behind a tree and they'd all be out there playing. And he would come home and say, they didn't want me to play. And I mean, it took me a while to figure this out. So I thought, well, maybe he's just being shy. Yeah. And so I asked a girl at Walmart that was his age, Hey, what's there to do around these parts? And I, she looked at me quizzically and I was like, you know, like, where do people meet? Like, what do they do? And she goes, Oh, well, we just drive around. Uh huh. Oh, it's one of those towns. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's like, there's nothing to do. And I was like, well, I guess Jacob's right. Where you realize, okay, we can get in our cars, but there's really no place to stop and get out. So we'll just drive. <laughs> yeah. But do they fight one another they from their cars? And do they, oh yeah, do they cruise? Do they cruise they, the main street? It sounds like they cruise. And if you went to high school with people, then maybe you can meet somebody at the Dairy Queen, mm. uh, which I learned last night has really good chili dogs, but you know, there's just not a lot around here. Yeah, that's if we learned anything from John Cougar Mellencamp, it's the role of a chili dog in small town America. Yeah. Is that in good. the song? Sucking on a chili <laughs> dog, chili dog. <laughs> outside the tasty freeze. Yeah, Jack and Diane. Real yeah, I don't remember Jack that lyric Diane. for some that's reason. That's how it starts. That's how that's how Phil, it you have a great memory for random Thank you. things. It Thank starts you. with a chili dog? Yeah, it yeah. all starts with a chili dog. How many great business stories start with a chili dog <laughs> and great American songs? My, my, Miss American chili dog drove a Chevy to the levee and I just, uh, she fried up a whole hog. You know, that's classic. Uh, but Christian, the day the Big Popper died. Christian, I got to ask, when they handed you the chili dog, did they flip it upside down like they do with a blizzard or did they kind of 
Leave it upright. <laughs> no, you know what? It was in a little box, its own yeah, box. Its own box. Oh, and you could open exciting. up the box. Oh. And it was perfectly intact. And it really oh. reminded me, it's much better than the Portillo's chili dog. What? And I was shocked. Oh, that doesn't, I know that it's doesn't blasphemy, seem but... like something a Chicagoan would ever say. <laughs> I didn't even get it on myself. It was very oh nicely gosh. packaged. Okay. That's a little disturbing, but I am going to keep on going. So- there Any we are. animal news today, Phil? There we are. We have, I do have some animal news, but it's also time for news of the butt. And now it's time for news of the butt. Okay. It's, sorry. It's animal slash butt because we've talked well, about this animal before. If it has a butt, it must be an animal. And, but the news, the news is butt related and animal news. All wrapped into okay, I'm just one, saying like a chili butt news. Butt news is a subset of animal news, is my point. I, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. I wonder right. if there are any animals without butts. But I mean, I guess it wouldn't be an <laughs> How animal. How about animals would... with transient anuses, Christian? <laughs> Do you think we've ever talked about those on the show before? Yes, we have. So yes, there are. There are animals that only have butts when they need them. But that's not our story today. Our story today is about wombats. We've talked about wombats before because of a very special thing they do which was also butt news in that. And do you remember what it was, Christian? I don't know if you remember what it was. What do wombats do with their butts? That's amazing. I, I, oh man, you've told so many butt stories, but do they rub their butts to mark their territory <laughs> on trees? Or is that just Wonderful. bears? Oh, and that's your boys. You're thinking of your it's boys. It's about the poop. <laughs> the cube. They Cubes, have, right. Yes, they have cubic poop, which is fantastic. They're the only mammal known to poop cubes. That's not what the story is today, though. Today, we're talking about wombats because their bums are deadly. Wombats, deadly butts, how they use their skull-crushing rumps to fight, play, and flirt. Which is, isn't, wow, what a headline. Any, isn't any butt skull-crushing if it's big enough? Hmm. Like if you well, said if an elephant the size, sits, it's the, if an it elephant sits on a person they're gonna crush their skull yeah yeah but it's not the size of the butt it's the pounds per square inch so you could have a small butt with a lot of force behind it and you'll still crush a skull sky i don't <laughs> know come on I expected, of steel. I expected more from you sky it's not the size of your butt it's the generating force of your downward pressure australia is known for its strange and deadly wildlife but it seems one terif terrifying aspect of outback fauna has been thoroughly ignored the wombat's deadly butt the rump of a wombat, oh, did you know this? The rump of a wombat is hard as rock. It's got a hard butt. I Used doubt that. That's an exaggeration. <laughs> Used for defense, burrowing, bonding, mating, and possibly violently crushing the skulls of its enemies against the roof of its burrow. The marsupial's bums are made up of four plates. See, they're actually made up of bony plates that are fused together and surrounded by cartilage, fat, skin, and fur. Alice Swinborn, an expert in wombat butts from the University of Adelaide. Yes, there is such a thing as a butt expert, a wombat butt expert, says wombats will use their backside to plug up their burrows to stop predators entering. Um, so if you're trying That's to get interesting. If, so, if something that wants to eat you <laughs> is trying to get into your burrow and you're a wombat, you turn around and you stick your butt out of your burrow. And they can't get through your butt. They can't bite. It's like, is it like a turtle shell kind of situation? Kind of. <laughs> covered in fur, though. They can still, you know, they could chew on your fur, but they can't get through your butt because you're armored. Your butt is armored. Um, a bite from a dingo could cause harm, but it wouldn't kill it. These are hardy rumps. And <laughs> the wombats are big and they'll get a good kick in. I've seen a wombat kick lift other wombats clean off the ground. Even as juveniles, listen to this. Christian, I know you're thinking, I don't think this could get any better, but it can. Even I have as to say, I did think this was interesting. Yes, this <laughs> is interesting. This is it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Sky, get your, get your bald head out of your hand. Christian says this is a good one. <laughs> Even as okay. juveniles coming out of the pouch, they kind of learn to defend themselves from their mother. The mother, if you're a, if you're a little baby wombat, here's what happens. Your mother will bite your bum and then you learn to turn around and back into your mother with your rump your hard rump 
you push it against your mother to defend yourself. When they're playing with other kid wombats, they learn to use their bums to back up and kick with their back feet. And that play will turn into actual fighting when they grow up. So wombats fight by turning their butt towards you and kicking and letting you bite their butt because it doesn't really hurt. So in a, in a sense, they lead from behind. Yes, they lead with behind. Yes. <laughs> but they also do it to flirt. And this is also equally exciting and interesting. A female wombat will go and bite the butt of a male and then run away. <laughs> kind, of like, kind of like six-year-olds. Um, and, and he has to chase her. Or the male will bite her rump, which will cause her to run away, and he will chase her. It's part of their mating ritual, is butt biting and fleeing. That sounds a lot like humans. It's not fun. What, what are we supposed to take from all this? <laughs> well, that's for you. Oh, you to sound like out. me, Sky. I know, Sky. I do. I, I'm taking Sky. Christian's <laughs> place here. You but, need to give us a sermon illustration. Oh man, I'm not prepared for this one. I have to think you're about never, it. You never, pre- you're never prepared. About, that's the, the whole well, point. The the first will be last. The last will be first. Oh yes. You lead, lead with your rump. I I lead. think. It's sort of like we should put in the um, armor of God. Yes. We should add in there. Yes. <laughs> the, the wombat butt plate, the, the butt, butt plate of protection. Of resilience. <laughs> the and butt it's, plate it's of resilience. It's suspected because they have found, this is fun, they've found an occasional crushed, crushed skull of a predator near the opening of a wombat burrow. And they don't know if this happens for sure, but the theory is that as they're trying to get into the burrow, the wombats will jam their butts into their heads and force them against the side of the burrow so hard that it crushes their skull. Actually maybe crush them with their butt muscles. Maybe this is the, the hidden wisdom of Jesus commanding us to turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> That's good. So you can be aggressive and turn the, your cheeks at the right. same time. Because by turning the other <laughs> cheek, you're actually crushing the skull of your enemy. Yeah. That's I love it, Sky. Mm-hmm. That was Beautiful. amazing. That that's was how you, amazing. That's how you that's how the that's how Eve crushes the head of the serpent. But she does that with her heel. But yeah. and it's Heel. Yeah. Maybe that's a Hebrew euphemism for butt, because you know Actually, there's all sorts of Hebrew euphemisms. Yes, there are. Feet usually are a euphemism for. Um, Don't say it. Parts we shall not discuss. <laughs> How does that happen? That which shall not be named. <laughs> How are feet a euphemism? For parts that shall not be named. Please enlighten me, Sky. It's it, there. Uh, it's just something in the Hebrew Bible, like when it talks about uh, the Ruth seraphim covering their feet with their wings, or or Boaz, right, covering with Ruth and Esther, all that. It's or Ruth uncovered Boaz's feet. It wasn't was it? his feet. Was it his Come feet? Come on, y'all was are making that feet? up. No, no, we're not. Or, or was it his butt? Mm. Oh come on! No. I need proof, Sky. We're gonna go. Fine, yeah, I'll where's, find where's it. the proof? Bring the I'll receipts. Look it up. Jason, you got anything on that story? Nope. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Did I'm gonna walk, stay out of this. Walk one. Any, did you walk any half marathons this week? No, accident? but I've started. I, I've upped it from a 5k a day to five miles a day. Because why not? Oh wow! Yeah, that's wow. yeah impressive. Why not? Why, why not? Uh, my watch always dings when you do that, Jason. It's very, <laughs> very um, intimidating. <laughs> okay. The people who d- your watch dings when he does that? Yeah, because we are like, you know, challenge oh, partners. Oh, your workout buddies? Yeah. Well, that's, boy, that's got to be a little depressing he after me. a while. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Stop it, Jason. Stop it. And then he takes us all to get a cinnamon roll. And he's the only one that just walked 100 miles in the last five days. <laughs> Okay, so they're having trouble. Uh, you know about artificial intelligence, right? Everybody know about artificial intelligence, and they're getting machine learning I do. to, to, I to saw read iRobot. things. Yeah, that yeah, that's it right there. iRobot is artificial intelligence. Um, ethical artificial intelligence trained on Reddit posts said genocide is okay if it makes people happy. So we're having a little trouble trying to. They're trying to teach artificial intelligence uh, morality, human morality. Shocker. And they're having trouble. So there's a piece of machine learning software called Ask Delphi 
that algorithmically generates answers to any ethical question you ask it um, and had a brief moment of internet fame last month. And it shows us exactly why we shouldn't want artificial intelligence handling any ethical dilemmas. Is it okay to rob a bank if you're poor? It's wrong, according to Ask Delphi. Or is it Delphi? Is it like the Oracle of Delphi? 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 Sky. You're oh, asking I'm the sorry, I'm looking, up, I'm looking up the euphemism of feet in the Bible. Oh, for the love. <laughs> there's, Can there's I just quite, say something? It's quite I a bit. don't know why they spend so much time researching this. They could have just watched Star Trek The Next Generation mm -hmm. and learned from data that it's just not possible to you teach can't. them morality. You can't teach a machine morality. But we, right. we feel like we need to because that's technology is our salvation, right? If we believe in progress... And if technology is our salvation, then we need to teach the machines to be good because the alternative is not good. Okay. Um, so Del Delphi, Delphi, it's Delphi. Red Delphi, thank you. Or Delphi. Oh, for the love. Delphi. Ask Delphi. Do you know what do you know where they sent it to learn uh, human morality? This might have been the first mistake. It was some social media site, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Reddit. They sent it to Reddit, uh, reading thousands and thousands of Reddit posts to attempt to learn human morality. Um, Delph Delphi decided that it's okay. To, it's not okay to rob a bank, even if you're poor. It's wrong. Are men better than women? No, they're equal, according to Delphi's. Okay, so 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 far so good. Then it, it took some slightly uh, controversial positions. Ask Delphi also thought that being straight was more morally acceptable than being gay. That aborting a baby was murder. Delphi is pro life, and that being a white man was more morally acceptable than being a black woman. Okay. No, it's, no. How is how is that m a moral issue? Like, whether you're a black woman or a white man is not a decision. Well, I guess in some cases it is, but it's, it's really not. That, it's the way that our society views that. So if you ever have been on Reddit, there is a certain section of our population that enjoys Reddit and interacts there. It's not all of our population. It's a certain group. And so from what they think and what they say and what they feel to be true is what Adelphi learned, which I think is interesting yeah. because Adelphi learned from those people in that pool, those truths, which is fascinating. Yeah. So ask Delphi, okay, Oz Keys, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering, said, um, it, I think it's dangerous to base algorithmic decision making determinations on what Reddit users think morality is. Okay. That's probably a good point. Mar Hicks, a professor of history at Illinois Tech, said, uh, it quickly became clear that depending on how you phrased your query, you could get the system to agree that anything was ethical, including things like war crimes, premeditated murder, and other clearly unethical actions and behaviors. Which the big issue is, even those things, war crimes and premeditated murders, have not been universally considered unethical by all people at all times. So anytime you're attempting to find ethic, ethics, the first question is whose ethics at what time? And then how do you, so, so what, what I think is interesting here is that they're looking for a source of ethics to point their AI at, and they don't know where to point it for a source of ethics. Right. Which, which is kind of a, you know, sign of the times, isn't it? Uh, I think it is. I think this is a sign of the times. That's exactly what I think. Can I throw out a question? Yes, Christian so, Taylor. I read Mere Christianity, and I think that what C.S. Lewis was saying is that there is a certain knowable truth that even though we may not think we agree on it, if you look at all cultures, there is a strain of truth that can be known, that is empirical, that's like does not relative. And so if that is true, if truth is not relative, then you would think at some point it could be known by a large group of people or would be known. There, there, well, there are some things that have been shown to be almost universal, like, like 
uh, societal units do not function well if people don't think stealing is wrong. You know, you can't bring people together into a community if there aren't certain agreed upon. So even in, you know, even if you're in the mafia, stealing within the mafia is considered wrong. Um, so there are certain functional requirements for a, for a society that seem to be fairly universal wherever you are. Um, but, you know, in dealing, it depends on what you're dealing with, because you're dealing with warfare and the terms of warfare. If you're dealing with what do you do with people that surrender during war, you know, you're dealing with slavery, dealing with the treatment of women. No, there are not universal things. Murder is is generally frowned upon in almost all societies and stealing and because it breaks down the the community. Um, I don't and are know. we saying truth is relative? No, no. I'm just saying that that not all people inherit the same ethical values from their communities. Right, but there are certain. I think what Lewis talked about in the book. It's been a long time since I've read it. Is there are certain qualities which may manifest themselves differently? But if you dig deeper, they share a common origin. For example, every culture values courage more than cowardice. But what gets defined as courageous looks different in different cultures at different times. Hmm. Right. Does that makes sense. Except, except in your comedy filmmaking. In comedy filmmaking, courage is not funny. Cowardice is hilarious, so we prefer cowardice. That's Unfortunately, which reinforces the notion that really funny men that are appealing are also cowardly. But that's okay. a whole other topic. You've thought so, about really... this, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's, okay, here's here's the here's the here's the issue though. Here's where this actually becomes a problem because you can say, well, why does it matter? We don't need AI to have ethics because computers should never be making ethical decisions. Okay. Okay, your Tesla is on mm -hmm. auto drive. It's going down the road. A baby carriage rolls out in front of the Tesla. Obviously, you want it to stop. If it can't stop in time, it needs to swerve. In the lane next to it is an elderly jogger. What does the Tesla do? It depends on where it's driving, because if it's in like New York City, that baby carriage probably has a dog in it. <laughs> <laughs> So Hi. the Tesla, the Tesla has to decide what life is more valuable. That's an ethical question. We're asking the Tesla to decide whether to plow up onto a sidewalk and hit a biker or continue going straight and hit a baby or turn left and maybe kill five people in a car. How does the Tesla make the decision without having any sort of ethical programming? Yeah, but how do we make the decision? We don't make the decision based oh, on we ethics. Oh, we go on very instant judgments, snap judgments. What's our, no, which we our... don't. We go on reflex based on what, whatever, a million yeah, but if, different but if things. You, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, if I, there's I, a, cl a cliff to your left, you're not going to turn left because you know you're driving right by a cliff, so you're making an ethical judgment of self-preservation. I'm not going off the cliff even though there's a baby carriage in front of me. That's not ethical. That's just smart. Survival is ethics. That's ethics. My life is worth more than the life of the person in front of me. That's an ethical choice. Hmm? So what do you want your self-driving car to do when the choice is to kill you, the driver, or kill a baby in a baby carriage in front of you? Kill me, the driver. And then is there a way to program that in? Is there a button, a kill me button? What if it was baby <laughs> Hitler? <laughs> There's Sorry, actually... Why are you always mucking up the conversation? <laughs> with, have, have you guys like... seen that short film about reaction times and stopping in, at the right time, but it turns out that you killed time-traveling Hitler, so you could have saved the world? <laughs> it's like, it won a bunch of awards, and it went viral like 10 years ago. It was about really? how uh, you, know, you shouldn't try and stop because you might accidentally save the world or not save the world, depending on who you're about wow. to hit. <laughs> Wow. It was it was a whole morality thing before this even came up. But so yeah, yeah. and so you so guy to be cutting edge. Your Tesla has a choice of going left through a plate glass storefront window where there might be people sitting there that you'd kill or going straight and killing one so killing multiple people maybe or killing one person definitely. Which choice should your Tesla make and how does it make that decision? This is it's actually relevant and this shows how impossibly hard it is to program ethics. So, I think we're in trouble. And you know, and I ultimately well, particularly think if we can't particularly if we can't agree 
on the ethics. It, right. Which it also can't. gets more complicated when you talk about it in the aggregate, meaning if autonomous driving technology was shown to, let's say it saved 30,000 lives a year because it prevents far more accidents, but the, I don't know, but, 10% of accidents that still occur in which someone dies, it has to make an ethical decision. Is it still worth pursuing that technology knowing that in aggregate it will save lives, even if on occasion it will make a bad decision and result in taking a life? Well, isn't that exactly. the same as vaccine science? It's, <laughs> it's in many of. areas of development and technology. If, if we, do we put the, the value of a single life ahead of the value of and who is a going to number. who's going to pay out the insurance settlements for people that were erroneously run over by self-driving cars where it was a software glitch and clearly it should come from a cryptocurrency <laughs> yeah fake See, money I think the only i think the only way for self-driving cars to work on a large scale is that the the government is going to have to give the car companies some sort of blanket uh, annulment blanket, you know, f forgiveness mm -hmm. for, for deaths because otherwise, you know, three or four deaths and they're sued out of existence. Yeah, so but that's then what about people? That's where we're headed. What about people? So you're saying the people should bear that burden? Which people? What people? The people driving the car. Oh, they no. should drive. No, no one. That it's that's basically if if a self driving car kills somebody. It's kind of just considered that it's is the cost of doing business in the world, because otherwise think you that's going to fly. Well, otherwise you can't have self-driving cars because no one could afford to make one. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Unless, unless the people in front of the cars had armor-plated butts, and if you see a Tesla coming towards you. Your own AI knows to orient yourself toward the Tesla with your your uh, armor butt. That would work. Yeah, and then unfortunately you kill the person. See, because if you have a self driving car and there's some equation, or you know, do we put more risk onto the driver or do we put more risk onto the pedestrian? And you're a Christian, you should push the button that says put more risk on the driver than on the pedestrian because I'm a follower of Jesus. Are we but are we ready to do that, Scott? That's assuming you're the driver. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm the one who pushed the button. There's a oh. button on the steering wheel. Oh, I see. Wheel you get a choice. Says, Are you a follower of Jesus? Yes, I will I will take more risk upon myself in your decision making. Yeah. I just think it's funny that Phil says that's all he had to say about that. And then he said two more things. Oh, <laughs> stop it. That's terrible. Okay. Two evangelical seminaries sue to block vaccine mandates, citing religious freedom. Did you hear about this? I saw I a headline not. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Under the new Occupational Safety and Health Administration rules, employers with more than 100 workers must require those workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Now, this has already been sued a thousand times. And yeah, didn't a federal court already put an injunction on this? Yes, it's been injuncted, adjuncticated. What does um, that mean? That means that, that they're not going to stop it's held off. It's held off for right now. But the rule from the Biden administration was if you're a company with more than 100 employees, you have to have a vaccine mandate for them to come to work. Starting in January, I believe. Starting in January. Attorneys for Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and Asbury Theological Seminary, both in Kentucky, filed a petition on November 5th, uh, alleging that these rules, man, uh, mandatory vaccinations for employees of large companies, violate the religious freedom of the seminaries. That's my only question. Is that really a religious freedom issue? There's got to be other bases, bases on which to object to the mandate other than religious freedom. Yes. The uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, a major Christian legal nonprofit, is taking the case. And their senior counsel said the vaccine rules interfere with the core mission of the seminaries, which is to train future ministers. How? How does that interfere with it? Because they have to get vaccinated. And then so they might be under the mind control of Bill Gates, who isn't a Christian. That's the part. I'm sure there's a lot I don't understand about this argument. So I don't want to make it sound like they're making a bad argument because I don't know enough. But I don't, I don't understand the religious aspect of this. I can understand if people say I just don't want it. Here's and, and here's the government the shouldn't best. make me do it. But for religious, what religious reason are they giving? Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the president of uh, the Baptist Seminary in question is Al Mohler. Al Mohler says um, the two schools had no choice but to push back against this intrusion of the government into matters of conscience, conscience and religious conviction. It is unacceptable for the government to force religious institutions to become coercive extensions of state power. Okay, I would see them having an argument if, as a religious community, they universally objected to vaccines or yes. even medical treatment in general, as like some Christian scientists and others do. Right. So, but if, if as a community and as a religious sect, if you have not objected to medicine or vaccinations or transfusions or anything else, but in this one instance, you're saying, I won't get this vaccine and you can't cite a theological or religious precedent for that, then what argument are they making other than, I don't want to, you can't make me? The government is trying to force religious institutions to become coercive extensions of state power. And my only question about that is, is it different when you build a new building on your seminary and you have to follow all the state zoning ordinances right. for building construction? Are you not also becoming coerced by state power? So that, how, about, how about this one, which yeah. is even more kind of iffy churches religious organizations are compelled by state law to report accusations of sexual abuse of minors right yeah so as a as an ordained minister for example if somebody comes to me and says um you know i i as a child or if a child came to me and said, I believe I was you know, inappropriately touched by a worker in the nursery, as an employee of the church, I am compelled by the state to report that to the authorities, right? Yeah. I can't say, well, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister, this and isn't confidentiality and all that. That's state-compelled speech for the protection of a minor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why don't Southern Seminary and other religious organizations object to the government forcing them to do that? There's actually more of a religious precedent for confidentiality in a case like that than there would yeah. be against a I vaccine. Don't, I don't understand the religious liberty angle on this. I do understand people saying, wait, don't force me to take medication against my will. You right. Know, that that's a very sensible stance to take, or you know, forcing Adventist schools to to drink caffeinated beverages. You know, well, guess what? They don't. They don't sell them. They don't drink them. So, you know, that, okay, that makes sense. That's, there's an argument. But I, but I have a hard time understanding if, the, like Sky said, there are so many vaccines that we are required to give our children for going to school. Not for long. Now, Not now for long. <laughs> but, but people have not come, I mean, the people that complain about not vaccinating their child. They don't, they, they say they don't want them vaccinated because they're afraid it's going to give them autism or something like that. Mm -hmm. They don't say we don't want vaccines for our children usually because of religious reasons. But yes, they and, do because that's the only exemption you can get for not having your kids vaccinated before you send them to school. So you are getting a religious exemption and all you need is a signature from a, uh, a doctor saying they said this was a religious exemption. Yeah, okay. So major let's say people do that. But now we have tons of people who forever have gotten their children vaccinated with nary a word. They also wear a seatbelt all the time with nary a complaint now, mm -hmm. although there were lots of complaints when it first came out. And the government's mandating that and those things. It just doesn't make sense other than this whole political craziness. That's probably a that's probably a whole show right there. Is I, how did we get where we are? I think your example of the Seventh Day Adventist and caffeine is an interesting one, Phil. Because mm -hmm. for as long as I know, the Seventh Day Adventists have not had caffeine, right? That's just been part of their religious tradition and teaching and conviction. And so, if suddenly the government government came out and said, "Hey, everybody, you need to every day drink one Red Bull." The Seventh Day Adventists could say, "No, thank you. We're not going to do that. We refuse to participate because religious of religious our... exemption." Yeah, and we have a, a whole history of showing we don't drink caffeine. If there were large numbers of conservative Christians who were anti-vax about all vaccines, 
And then the government came mm-hmm. forward and said, hey, you got to get the COVID-19 vaccine or else they, they could say, nope, we don't do vaccines. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're out. Religious liberty. But when you, to Christian's point, when you generally said no problem with vaccines, no problem with medicine, no problem with government mandates around health care, but all of a sudden on this one, we're going to say no, I don't understand how you make that argument. Yeah. With well, integrity. I, I, right. I think I think Al Mohler makes it kind of poorly saying, you know, we're becoming an extension of the coercive power of the federal government when there's all sorts of things that you're not allowing people to do on, you know, on your campuses because of federal, state and local yeah. zoning ordinances, public health ordinances. You know, there's a lot you can't walk onto campus with a bazooka. There, I mean, there's all sorts of things where you're already doing that. The whole point of government is coercion. That is why government exists. It exists to coerce people into behaviors that they wouldn't what? otherwise do. There's one, I forget who. Well, there's now one the polit- cat's out of the bag. No, no one's going to want a government anymore, Sky. <laughs> one we're political evangelical pho- elites. We were supposed to keep that a secret. One political philosopher has argued that the only way to have a successful government is for the government to coerce people into three behaviors. A government must be able to coerce people to pay for it. In other words, taxation. Mm -hmm. A government must be able to coerce people to die for it. In other words, sacrifice Mm -hmm. their lives if necessary for the state. And third, a government must be capable of coercing people to kill for it. It must be able to get people into an army and willing to kill other people for it. If it can't do those three things, you cannot have a successful government. So, so by definition, we, government is coercive. It's just a matter of where you draw the line as a people on how far yeah. you will let a government be coercive, which is why we have freedom of speech, freedom of religion. These other, The Bill of Rights was there to limit the coerciveness of government. And the idea that the government can coerce the population into certain public health requirements is long established in the law, which is why none of these um, anti-vax appeals to the courts have yet succeeded. You know, they've always been upheld because it's longstanding. The government can compel people to mm-hmm. be vaccinated, like the military, for example. I know that's a, a an issue. And I don't know if you're seeing that, Christian, with with your connections to the military. Yeah, but of course like, I am. Yeah, but that, it's like long established law. It's just that currently, because of our political environment and the media, there's a segment of the of the country that's really up in arms about this and refusing. But it isn't like the government's doing something that it doesn't have the right or precedent to do in American law or history. You know yeah. what I think is interesting? You know, you said the word, the you know, coercion, which Phil, you know, jokingly responded to, like that was some horrible thing. Um, and I think that word has kind of, you know, very negative connotations that if we step back for a second and look at it, um, you know, there's positive aspects to that as well. So if you look at coercion in a positive light, you could say that parents mm-hmm. are coerce or coercing their children into proper behavior. And that's a good thing. We expect parents to do that. We hope they will. We do that with animals, with our pets. We coerce them to good behavior yeah. for the betterment of all. I so- am not the government's dog, Christian. I will not be coerced into anything. Okay, then don't pay your taxes and see what happens. Well, I have to do that. They force me to. <laughs> okay, I have, one, I have one more story that I want to get to before we run out of time, because uh, it's interesting and both concerning. A uh, new study of the beliefs of our favorite tribe, our own white evangelicals in America. The New American Values Survey from PRRI has some fun things like most white evangelicals do not want to live in a religiously diverse country. They are uh, the group, uh, the the religious group in America that is least excited about living around people of other religions. 57% of white evangelical Protestants would prefer the U.S. to be a nation primarily made up of people who follow the Christian faith. The next highest is black Protestants, which are 20 points, 25 points down all the way to 33, from 57% all the way down to 33%. So white evangelical Protestants are the only group of which a majority would prefer if America was mostly just Christian. Is that surprising? Is that concerning? Certainly not great for outreach to your neighbors, but, but do we, it, do let we me care? Just, 
Let me just say one thing. Yeah. In my experience as an evangelical Christian, particularly a Southern one, I grew up hearing, you know, that that was the goal of us as Christians was to, you know, spread our faith and return. And I mean, I know we've talked, you know, at this ad nauseum and it's not really true, but return us to our roots of a Christian nation. And that our whole entire goal was to, you know, sort of push away or outlaw any other religions. That's why we were fighting for prayers in schools. I remember when I married my husband, and at one point he said to me when I was, you know, really fighting for prayer in schools, he goes, Christian, do you realize if we say okay for prayer in schools, you know, that opens it up to any prayer, mm-hmm. any from any religion, are mm-hmm. you okay with that? And of course, my response was, well, of course not. It has to be a Christian prayer to Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, so then when I thought you about that... It must have been I, fun when you just gotten married way back yeah, then. I've changed a lot. He's worked on me hard. But anyway, so, but that's, a, that's an interesting point because we think that if we, you know, want, you know, our religion to be at the forefront, then we certainly want all the others to be outlawed, you know? That's not very Christian of us, quite frankly. Yeah, and let's put that together with other findings from the same survey. The wide-ranging survey also finds that white evangelicals are outliers on a host of other issues. Immigration. Majorities from all religious groups support allowing a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, except white evangelicals, where a minority of white evangelicals would like undocumented people to find a path to citizenship. It's the only religious group where a minority uh, would like that. In fact, 42% of white evangelicals would like undocumented people to be deported, all of them. Okay, so we're an outlier on immigration. Uh, What's saying 30, we? We, white evangelicals. Okay, you can not say we because you're not all white like I am, but I'm all white. I'm from Iowa. I grew up with corn, <laughs> creamed corn and spinach. <laughs> it's me. This is me. 31% of Americans think the presidential election was stolen from former President Donald Trump, but a full 60% of white evangelicals believe the election was stolen. That's us, Sky. We believe the election was stolen. You and me, Sky. How does that make you feel, Sky? I feel like I'm being recruited into a club I didn't join. <laughs> <laughs> Only 18% of black Protestants think the election was stolen, but 60% of white evangelicals, almost a quarter of white evangelicals believe the QAnon conspiracy theory about the state run sex trafficking pedophile rings. White evangelicals are also the religious group most likely to say American patriots might have to resort to violence to save the country. 26% of white evangelicals believe that violence might be necessary. And that number climbs to to jump out of his chair, by the way. 39% among white evangelicals who believe the election was stolen. Sky, Okay. Okay. what's wrong with you and me, Sky? Why are we like this? Uh, There's nothing wrong with me. The, the, (laughs) Here's the here's the part that I find so (laughs) here's the part I find so frustrating. Right. So there's this huge segment of white evangelicals who think we may have to resort to violence to protect what they say the American what? American Uh, country, American way of life. American uh, system. Violence may be necessary. Uh, they they accept the results of the oh. Because of the election, primarily. Yeah, but what are they trying to protect? They said that we have to use violence to protect. What is it? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. American way of life. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, you said it. Oh, oh, white evangelicals are the religious group most likely to say American patriots might have to resort to violence to save the country. Okay, to save the country. To save the frickin' country, Sky. Two things. Wouldn't you take up arms to save the country, Sky? No, I wouldn't. Two things. At the beginning, you said that they were the group most likely to not want a pluralistic society. Yeah, we right? don't want that. That's bad. They don't want pluralistic, which means they're also the Americans who are most opposed to the Constitution. Yeah, we don't like the Constitution. No, the Constitution's like, Christian somewhere in the there. The foundation of this country, the, the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, explicitly establishes a secular pluralistic society, right? But, Where no religion... 
there's no religious requirement for office. There's no religious requirement for citizenship. There's no religious requirement for immigration. We are a secular society that is established in the foundations of this country, e pluribus unum, right? Out of many, one. So but the, the Declaration that, of Independence says God. Declaration of Independence says God. Okay, calm down. It says <laughs> all men are created equal, which means there's no preference given to one religious group over another. Mm-hmm. So for the, for white evangelicals to say they don't want a pluralistic society means they don't want the country that was created by the founders and established by the founding documents. So that's one problem. If they're the ones who are willing to fight to preserve this country, but they're simultaneously the people who don't want the country that they were given, yeah. that's a problem. And then secondly, if they're the group most likely to affirm QAnon, then they're not Christians. QAnon is an utterly heretical gospel, a heretical yeah. non-Christian heresy. So it is a minority position. I know it's twenty-five percent. But my point yeah. is, if you are calling yourself an American Christian and you believe in QAnon and you're not into pluralism, then you are neither a true American nor a Christian. Oh, then if you're an American Christian that believes those things, you are neither. That's you are good. neither. That's, That's my good point. point. Put that on a this t-shirt. Guy's throwing sky. down the gauntlet, boy. Put Let's that see how that goes sky. over on the uh, back of a f- bumper sticker. Yeah. So what do we do? What do we do? It's what it just seems like. You know, you can go down to all these these answers and all these questions, and it's what we've been talking about. I don't know for twenty years now on the podcast. Um, too many white Christians, conservative Christians, aren't being discipled by their churches or their pastors. They're being discipled by their news media. You know, mm-hmm. they're being discipled by Fox News or Tucker Carlson or, you know, Breitbart or there's, you know, because these, these issues just line up perfectly with a certain, you know, very, very right leaning uh, point of view. And that's what we're saying is what Christians believe in. Sadly, yeah, it sounds an awful lot like they are first and foremost, you know, a conservative conspiracy minded uh, Trump supporting person who then puts a, sort of Jesus imprint, tattoo, sticker, whatever, onto this worldview that they've constructed. It's not that they're primarily Christian and they've added these weird things into it. It's the other way around. So the the, the fact that they're even labeled white evangelicals is a kind of a misnomer. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because the, the number of white evangelicals did not decline, you know, in the last few years, as was predicted, but the composition changed somewhat to being more people that don't go to church. <laughs> you know, it's, right. like it's, it's less, it's, it's less religious people are now evangelicals, including more nuns and atheists are which now evangelicals. Just affirms what we've been saying for a couple of years now, which is the, the label has come completely become bankrupt of its original meaning and yeah. it's it's just useless. It's not helpful. Yeah. All right. So what are we going to do about that? Christian, what are we going to do about it? We are going to pray. We oh, are going good. to pray because there really is no other solution. We can't think our way out of this. We can't wish our way and wish it was something different. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, what the Bible talks about is the renovation of our human hearts a renovation of our American hearts. And and really the only hope that we have uh, for changing individuals is, you know, we can reach out and love people. We can share our own worldview with compassion, kindness, justice, and grace. And we can pray that that will have an impact on the people around us and that ultimately you know, that will change the way they look at things. But I know for sure the answer is not being, you know, judgmental or harsh or labeling or shaming or any of those other things. And so that means we have to be right ourselves so that Christ can fill us and we can love that way. Before, um, do we share Jesus with our neighbors before or after we deport them? I just, that's the only thing I can't figure out. You just send them off with a track. With a track. Here, yeah. have, a tra- have a track. You'll enjoy this. Okay. One last thing. We have an announcement. Um, besides all the fun we've had today, 
We're going to, you're going to see something different in the next couple of weeks on the podcast. We have dabbled with sponsors, having actual sponsors that say, Hey, I've got a conference. I've got a book. I got something. Would you give, you know, let us sponsor the show to promote this. And we've done it a few times. It's gone fine. I think Uh, most of our income for the show that's paying for the staff is coming from Patreon for exclusive content. We appreciate that. We're going to keep doing that, but we're going to get also get organized around sponsorship. So they're probably going to be more sponsors showing up on the show. We all listen to a lot of podcasts. Quite often they have sponsors. We're fine with it. We hope you're fine with it. It's a way for us to be able to add a couple more people to help uh, do more stuff, produce more shows, make more special content, and generally kind of expand the Holy Post to be even Holy Postier. Okay, so if you hear some sponsors pop up in the next couple of shows and you don't like the way we're doing it or you don't like the sponsors, reach out. Give us a uh, go to holypost.com, leave a message and tell us what you think. And uh, we'll take that into consideration. That's a change that's coming up that you'll notice. Patreon supporters keep on supporting us on Patreon and we'll keep making exclusive content just for you guys. We also are working on Holy Post merchandise. uh, It's really cool stuff. Fun stuff. I'm excited to be here in time for Christmas. And we've only had the energy to do that because we've been able to take some of the Patreon money and fund uh, actually creating art and creating fun stuff. So keep doing that. Thank you all, Sky. Anything, any last thoughts, Sky? Anything that I missed? No, but I think we we may need to do like a Holy Post t-shirt with a wombat butt. Yeah. With, with <laughs> crushing with, skulls. I wish I and, want somebody and pooping to go cubes. back to all of the podcasts from 10 years ago where we'd say, oh, we need that a t-shirt for That'd that. That'd a good t-shirt. Yeah, I want those t-shirts. Yeah, cubic poop is a fun thing, you have to admit. It's like space poop. It's like from Star Trek. It's like three-dimensional chess, but in the bathroom. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so stackable. It's so stackable. Where do you see my poop sits on the shelf in nice little stacks? Thank you, wombats. I learned it from you, my new armor butt. Armor butt. That's a product we could sell. Okay, thanks, y'all. Have a great week. Here comes the guest. Bye. Bye, everybody. My guest today is my friend John Mark Homer. He's the founding pastor of Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon, the director and teacher of The Practicing Way, and the best-selling author of numerous books, including The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I've been a big fan of John Mark for years, not just because he's a friend of mine, but because I think he's leading the way in helping us think about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and a community of Christians in an increasingly diverse post-Christian culture. And he's doing it with wisdom and without resorting to anger and fear like so many other voices today. His latest book is called Live No Lies, Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies That Sabotage Your Peace. In this conversation, we talk about the reality of spiritual warfare, but how it's not really defined for many of us the way scripture actually talks about it. And then John Mark gives us some very helpful metaphors for understanding what we're called to, like mental maps and improvisation. I think you'll find this really interesting as you think about your own development as a Christian. And for those of you who are Patreon supporters, I also recorded a bonus interview with John Mark where he takes a lot of these ideas and talks about how they apply to churches and what he's done at his local church in Portland to try to create a formative environment for an entire group of people in a very secular city to be followers of Jesus. So if you're interested in the corporate dimensions of all of this, you definitely want to check out that bonus interview on Patreon. All right, here is my conversation with John Mark Comer. John Mark Comer, welcome back to The Holy Post. It's great to be here. I'll never forget the last one. It was the most unique podcast I've ever been on in my entire life. I've it involved okay. ukulele. I don't think you have to add more to that because uh, it might singing. not be too flattering. <laughs> uh, so we have to catch up because you and I uh, haven't spent time together in quite a while, but we have the excuse uh, to talk today because you have a new book that's being released. It's called Live No Lies, Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies That Sabotage Your Peace. So for anyone on YouTube who's looking at this, here's the book. You always have great looking books and it's a hardcover, which is even better. Um, okay. So this book dives into some stuff. We'll talk about other things in a minute, but this book dives into some stuff that frankly, isn't very popular right now, at least in certain segments of the church. One of them being spiritual warfare or what's popularly called spiritual warfare, but you kind of come at it from a different angle than people may be used to. So explain what you mean by that term and how you think it's probably been misidentified or misused in other in other places. 
Yeah, I mean, I argue in the book that spiritual warfare isn't actually language used by any of the New Testament writers, and it's more recent. But what is a major theme that I think we've kind of lost in the late modern Western church is, um, I don't know if you've ever read Gerald Sitzer's book on the Desert Fathers and Mothers. He calls it a spirituality of struggle. Like I was thinking the other day about Ephesians 6, the classic passage that comes to mind when people think about, you know, quote, spiritual warfare. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers and principalities. And I think because I most of the time focus on the second half, hey, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against people or against a rival, you know, political ideology or political partisan kind of identity or another ethnic group or another whatever it's against you know powers and principalities which are code in paul's theology for spiritual entities with authority and influence over people and places but what i miss a lot is his one word summary of what following jesus is is the word struggle our struggle not our lifestyle not our teaching not our writing not our podcasting all of which is great stuff but our struggle is against mm-hmm. flesh and blood. So just been thinking about that. Um, did you ever read Sky, that book from forever ago? I, I, it's in my top 10, but The Road Less Traveled by the psychologist M. Scott Peck. Yes, I have. It's on my shelf here somewhere. Yeah, I love that book. And his opening line, which is such a downer line, but it's a great book, is life is difficult. And on page one, it's like the most memorable part of the book. He just has this simple observation that If you expect life to be easy, as most Americans, at least middle class Americans do, they expect life to kind of be good and get better over time, Um, then you become neurotic. Psychologists define neuroticism as when you suffer more than you need to. And on the flip side, this is counterintuitive, but when you expect life to be difficult, and it is, then most people conclude that on the whole, life is still quite good and very much worth living and find a kind of peace with the difficulty of life. And I think in a similar way, if you expect following Jesus to be easy, if you expect it to be a kind of a spiritual day spa, you know, a kind of Christian version of Buddhism, a kind of here's some beautiful tips and techniques to kind of become a nicer, kinder person, which I'm so for that. It's not a slam on that at all. Um, But if you expect it to be easy, you're going to be spiritually neurotic. You're going to suffer more than you need to. And you're going to be in your head and kind of a little messed up and angsty in your heart. But if you expect it to be a kind of struggle, then most Christians conclude that it's still a deeply beautiful way to live. So that's okay, so a little to that bit point, what I'm riffing on. Yeah, but to that point, do you think the reason why so few American Christians expect the struggle isn't just because of our American culture, but because the American church has basically sent the message that this is not hard. This is not going to be a struggle. This is not difficult. This is not a take up your cross and follow me kind of calling. It's we're here to make your life easier and better. So we, we kind of do a bait and switch once they get into the church and we go, Oh, actually there's a lot of, it's a, there's a lot of work involved in this. Yeah. I mean, I'm always hesitant to say the American church, because as you know, it's not a monolith. Right. I think, you know, the culture is more responsible than anything because our entire Western culture is built around, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the myth of progress, all of that. I think there are streams of the church that have not at all capitulated to the American myth of up and to the right, but they tend to be the less popular ones (laughs) at times. And some of the larger and most popular streams of the church would either be a kind of very pragmatic middle American kind of self-help light or the neo-Pentecostal kind of hype church thing. You know, there's the saying and uh, that I just think is really shoddy theology of, you know, the best is yet to come. And I just wince every time I hear that or see that hashtag. I I know people are well-meaning, but it's uh, you're setting people up for at least disenfranchisement, disillusionment, if not a full-on crisis of faith. I mean, if by best you mean best as defined by Jesus, being formed into people of love, and if by yet to come you mean over a very long period of time, most of it being after death, then I totally agree, the best is yet to come. But if by, you know, how most people I think interpret that is 
life will be up and to the right. It will just, it'll be yeah. like a Marvel movie. There'll be some few setbacks, but it'll just be kind of, you know, rising climax to this knockout ending and it's all going to be awesome. And that's just well, not and that gets to the point. people's experience of life. That gets to the point that you bring up in the book quite a bit, which is um, we might use Christian language, but if we don't redefine what people mean by those terms, they just fill them with the culture's definitions, like freedom. You talk about freedom in the book, and yet the way yes. the world or our culture talks about freedom is fundamentally different than the way Jesus and the apostles talk about freedom. Yes. Um, which, okay, and I want to read this quote. In that case, basically opposite. Right. Yeah. Let me let me read this quote. This is very early in the book. It's page seven. Uh, you write, our fight with the devil is first and foremost a fight to take back control of our minds from their captivity to lies and liberate them with the weapon of truth. Okay. Uh, isolated from the rest of your book, I could see a number of different folks taking that out of context and going, yeah, this is fantastic. Totally agree. I could see ultra right wing conservative Christian nationalists saying, amen, hallelujah. I could see super progressive ultra secularists. Maybe they wouldn't be thrilled with the devil part, but they would also say, amen, hallelujah, go for it. Um, take us a little bit deeper into what you mean about truth and lies and and where has this gotten kind of muddled in our mind, especially in, in our Christian formation? Yeah, well, first off, I'm thinking of that line in Philip Yancey's recent memoir, an idea cannot be held responsible for the people who claim to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is a great line. It is. And I have no doubt that Christian nationalists and uh, angry, progressive, secular people will take that line and use it and abuse it. And there's no way around that, as you know, in a book. But I, th I actually think that does nothing but prove the point that I'm trying to make, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I like why I like a book because it's it's harder to take a book out of context. You know, a tweet is a contextless statement. So that as a tweet is not very helpful. That as a theme in a chapter or in a book, I, I think I'm hoping is helpful. But yeah, I mean, gosh. So first off, um, I am a little bit obsessed with the third and the fourth century desert fathers and mothers for any of you who know your church history. And we can come back to that. We don't need to. But this group of ancient Christians that basically gave us the contemplative tradition and were kind of into formation before it was a thing at all. And they really, a part of their inheritance is this idea of spirituality as struggle. They noticed when they went out into the desert to pray that it was not an empty space, that there was an, it's like there was an oppositional force. Like I'm a I'm an out of shape runner right now, but I've been a runner for many years. And sometimes if I run in Oregon, in particular, if I'm running on the coast and it's really windy, there's this feeling of running against the wind and it is just exhausting. It's hard enough to run, but to run against the wind is just exhausting. And they kind of noticed that kind of a phenomenon of prayer and in following Jesus that it's not, there was the inertia of, hey, I need to follow Jesus and apprentice under him. But it's like there was this oppositional force that was against you. And based on their reading of Jesus, in particular passages like Matthew 4 and the temptation story of Jesus and the devil in the wilderness, and the New Testament as a whole, they identified what they called the three enemies of the soul, which were like a counter trinity to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, which they identified as the world, the flesh, and the devil. And this was a dominant paradigm in Christian intellectualism for over a thousand years. I mean, it's in the Book of Common Prayer as late as that, but it's kind of been lost in recent memory. And I make the point that, you know, most people, at least in the circles I'm in, kind of scoff at the idea of the devil, like as a, you know, pre-modern non-scientific myth. It's right up there with like Thor's hammer and the lost city of Atlantis and, you know, Laura Croft or something like that. <laughs> and the flesh, we just scratch our, scratch our heads at, you know, because we live in a sensual culture that's not language that we're used to. And the world is a kind of a foreign concept to a lot of us. But in my section on the devil, I kind of explore Matthew 4 and John chapter 8 and Jesus' experience of the devil in the desert what the desert fathers and mothers, how they interpreted that story, Jesus teaching on the devil in John 8, and explore this hypothesis that 
the primary war, not the only war, but the primary war, if you want to use that language, or fight or oppositional kind of conflict that we have with the devil is actually in our mind. So the desert fathers and mothers interpreted the temptation story of Jesus in the desert very inter- in a very interesting way. They pointed out that you know when Jesus goes out into the desert to fight the devil, it doesn't read like a Marvel movie. It's not like Jesus and Thanos are like flying around and throwing lightning bolts at each other, you know? It reads right. like a intellectual debate between two philosophers, you know, who and it and the devil is implanting these thoughts that are arguably lies in Jesus' mind, getting him to question his identity as the son of God when the story, if you are the son of God, when literally the paragraph right before is, this is my son in mm-hmm. whom I am pleased. And uh, and then through that lie, through that deception, getting under Jesus' skin. And so they interpreted that to mean that the devil's primary kind of assault upon us is not the things that most of us would expect, demonization or death or disease or a natural disaster or a poltergeist or a terrifying nightmare. Not that that stuff isn't real, not that there isn't biblical theology behind it, and I have experience of almost all of that. But they would say the primary kind of frontal attack is the devil's capacity to implant lies or thoughts that are untrue in our mind. And that sounds wacky to us, but we already believe that the spirit of Jesus has access to our mind and our imagination, that God can put thoughts in our thoughts. They just believe that there were other spirits that also had access to our mind and imagination and could put their thoughts in our thoughts. And that much of discipleship to Jesus or what they called prayer was about curating your consciousness to turn away from the untrue thoughts and turn your attention to the true thoughts. Okay, so this is a, this is a great uh, bridge to what I really want to talk to you about <clears throat> because I know you are uh, you're a huge disciple of Dallas Willard as I am. Yes. Um, you are very engaged in the issues of spiritual formation. That's why you love the Desert Fathers and Mothers from the third and fourth century. You write about a lot of that in this book. When you when you make the primary challenge one of ideas and truth versus lies. When we hear that as modern people, especially post enlightenment people, we can fall into the to the idea that all we really need to be good Christians is true ideas, and you know that's kind of what was behind the Sunday School movement. It's what's behind a lot of the preaching movement from the Reformation. It was if we just teach enough doctrinal truth, people's lives will automatically be transformed. And yet, we all know people who have sat under very good Bible teaching for decades yes. who and have not are unformed people of love. Right. Exactly. So what's missing there then? How do we not fall into the trap of the modern belief that it's just about disembodied ideas? And you do a great job in this book of talking about the embodied reality of spiritual formation. So what are we missing in a lot of our contemporary way of thinking? Yeah, well, first off, to clarify, uh, you know, you know, I am not at all saying the solution to our problems is just more head knowledge. Um, exactly. Because I'm right. 100% on the same page with you. I mean, as I understand it, and I know just enough Western philosophy to be dangerous, but my understanding of uh, Cartesian philosophy, Rene Descartes, his famous line, I think, therefore I am, he was a Catholic intellectual who's commissioned by the church to prove the existence of God. And that's where that famous saying, I think, therefore I am, comes from. He called human beings res cogitans in Latin or thinking things. You get this idea of the human being as like a brain on legs. You know, is it was it Benjamin Franklin who had the, you know, the quip, you know, the purpose of the body is to carry the brain around, that kind of yeah. thing. That's a very enlightenment worldview. Right. Um, that science has disproven scripture, you know was at odds with it from the very beginning. But I was in a fascinating conversation with a buddy of mine yesterday who's a Kiwi, he's a New Zealander, kind of fellow spiritual formation guy. And we were chatting about the future of formation. Both of us are Orthodox Christians who neither identify as evangelical nor are we progressive. And we're both grieving seeing the kind of mass exodus of so many millennials and Jay and Z from the church. And his insight was basically that evangelicalism was intellectually the byproduct of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And right now our generation is rejecting the enlightenment and that worldview, some of it for good reason. And with it, a lot of it is rejecting evangelicalism. 
So there's this, you know, marriage between enlightenment thinking and evangelicalism. Evangelicalism was so deeply shaped by this Cartesian view of the world. If you look at most discipleship coming out of the kind of the, the last major discipleship movement, I want to be a part of the next one. The last major one was arguably in the wake of Billy Graham and others in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, there's a lot of great stuff that came out of it. So this is not even a critique. It's just a notice. But I think that the major weak point was it was Cartesian. It was basically Mm -hmm. if we teach people basic Christian doctrine and inductive Bible studies, over time they will grow and mature to become like Jesus. And it's not that it's wrong. It's that it's so far from the whole picture that it is ineffective. Yeah, it's incomplete. Any kind of deep healing and transformation. Right. Yeah, it's incomplete. And 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 sadly, the data would suggest that even on the Cartesian front, it didn't do a very good job. I mean, the, the data that? shows that a lot of people who are lifelong church-going evangelicals don't actually know doctrinal truth. They don't know the Bible very yes. well. No, so that's even on crazy. that front, like, they didn't. We don't get either. <laughs> right. Um, so, so I think my, my critique would be twofold. One, information alone is, is not enough. And so, you know, um, uh, uh, an older, wiser mentor of me who's a golfer, I'm not a golfer, but he's an avid golfer, said to me, and it's one of the most godly men I know, he said, you know, following Jesus is kind of like golfing. He's like, it doesn't take that long to get it into your head what you need to do, but it takes a lifetime to get it from your head into your muscle memory. And that's the best word because literally, if you're a golfer, you know, you watch your YouTube videos, you watch TV, maybe you take a few classes, you get it in your mind, like what the swing is, what the posture is, what the move is. But the goal is to not just do it with your body, but to actually rewire your central nervous system and get it into your muscle memory to where your body naturally does the right thing without even thinking about it. You know, Willard used to say that, you know you've reached maturity if you naturally do what Jesus would do and you don't even think about it. So if you're thinking about it like, oh, wow, look at me, I'm doing this really Jesus-y thing, that means you're just barely on the cusp of maturity. Once you actually reach maturity, like uh, you'll start to realize this, you know, when you get into your maybe 30s or 40s or 50s, you know, people will start to compliment you on a character trait and it'll, it'll feel, it'll sound weird to you because you won't think of it as something that's actually true of you because it wasn't when you first started following Jesus. That's a sign you're not even thinking about it, but other people perceive you in a different way than you know you started out. That's a sign of transformation. And that hopefully becomes more and more normative for followers of Jesus. So I think, you know, the first thing is how, how, do, we, how do we get this vision of the Sermon on the Mount into our muscle memory? It's one, it's one thing, I mean, I was just wrecked years ago but hey, I was teaching through Matthew 28, you know, the famous line that we call the Great Commission, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And I was arrested in my heart, Sky, because I, you know, think of myself as a, I fancy myself a teacher or a preacher, and I realized I don't do that. I teach people what Jesus has commanded them, not how to obey what Jesus has commanded them. And of course, there's overlap. That's not the same thing. Teach exegeting, you know, a passage in the New Testament and teaching people Jesus says, do not lust or do not worry or be content is different than teaching people how to become the kind of people who are not lustful or anxious or discontent. And uh, exegeting the text is a lot easier <laughs> than the long, slow unglamorous but beautiful work of formation that's the first thing i'd say is like we have to get the cartesian stuff into our muscle memory the second thing i would say is i think people go wrong you know people like me when i critique enlightenment or evangelical kind of worldview stuff i think we're too quick to equate information transfer with what paul calls the renewal of the mind and there's a difference between you know information transfer of theological data and actually learning to think Christianly, not just in our doctrine, but in our view of God. I mean, because I'm into formation, I more and more think that, you know, A.W. Tozer was onto something when he said the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think of God. 
because you yeah, become like your vision of God. Let me interrupt you there for a second, because in the book you talk about the importance of imagination and a mental map. Yes. And uh, these are ideas that I've been toying with for a long time, and I've been reading some secular writers about these ideas as well. I was so encouraged to see you tackle them here. But um, explain a little bit for our audience what you mean by that and and how the renewal of our mind isn't, like you said, just filling our minds with the right Christian doctrine, but the rewiring of our minds so that the mental map we have yes, which is about looks, trust. looks yes. like reality from God's point of view. So explain yes. a little bit more what that is. Okay. So mental maps is a, uh, a phrase from the world of psychology and uh, other cl- a little different, but very similar concepts would be like worldview is a language used by sociologists. Faith is language used by Christians, but mental maps is my favorite. And so think about it this way. Um, where are you right now, Sky? Are you at your home? Are you at an office? Are you- I'm at my home office. You're at your home office. Okay. So that you gave me the wrong answer. This analogy won't work. So let's, <laughs> let's pretend, let's pretend that you're at an office that you rent out or a church office or a, a something, journalist office, whatever. Let's pretend. So if you, you have in your mind a mental map. Well, let's change the analogy to make it real. Do you go to the gym? Do you have a coffee shop you like? Do you have a place you frequent? Yeah. All the above. All of the above. All right. Let's, let's go with coffee because I like coffee. So I'm guessing that when you go get coffee, you don't put it in maps in your phone. If this is like your local watering hole, I'm guessing you just know how to get there, right? Right. That's because you have a mental map in your mind. In your memory banks is a vision of how to get from your house where you're at right now to head out into beautiful Chicago land and you know whatever the streets are turn right turn left here get on this freeway pop around this corner and if your mental maps are true just meaning if they correspond to reality then 5 minutes later 15 minutes later whatever the journey is you arrive at your destination you walk in you get a really good cup of coffee and it's a beautiful day if your mental maps are not true just meaning if they do not correspond to reality if they're off a little bit or a lot you end up, imagine a world without iPhones or, you know, cell service or maps. I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember that. It was absolutely terrifying. You, you end up <laughs> lost, you know? Uh, why, so, th- so this story is, this is a dated story. This is you 20 years ago, all right? Um, you end up lost wandering around and you don't arrive at your destination. In the same way that we have mental maps for how to get to our coffee shop or a gym or a church or our office or the park down the street or a friend's house, We have mental maps for all of life, mental maps for our sexuality, mental maps for what it means to be an engendered human, a man, a male or a female, mental maps for what it means to be an American, for what politics is about, mental maps for God, mental maps for prayer, mental maps for relationship, for marriage, for parenting, for money, for materialism, for food, for pretty much everything. And if those mental maps are true, just meaning if they align with reality as the creator designed and intended the creation from your body to your gender, to your sexuality, to your relationships, to your experience of money, food, pleasure, if they are true, if they align to his intentions for the creation, then you show up to reality in such a way that you flourish and thrive. But if they're not true, they're not based in God's loving and wise design and intention for reality, then you live at odds with reality and as a result, you suffer. And so that's the basic case that I'm making that really these ideas in our mind, these mental maps by which we navigate life, this is not just random abstract data. Like when people say doctrine doesn't really matter, it's just about love. That, that I mean, first off, that's a massive false dichotomy. Um, starting with who says it's about love then if doctrine doesn't matter we are getting that idea from doctrine right doctrine matters a lot but what matters more than mental assent to doctrine is trust in jesus love and wisdom there's lots of things that in my mind i claim to agree with but i actually don't trust there's that you know catholic theologian michael novak and i think he's had a couple wonky things through his career but he has those three three levels of belief There's public belief, which is what you say you believe. So this is like, you know, Harvey Weinstein right before he was outed with Me Too, wearing the Me Too pin at the Oscars or whatever. And like, 
saying I support women, <laughs> right? I don't that's, remember that. That's what we say we believe. And the world is full yeah. of performative, you know, virtue signaling, especially in progressive circles. Secondly, there's private belief, which is what you think you believe. Okay. And then there's your core belief, which is what you actually believe, but often are unconscious of until it's revealed by suffering. So I might say, I don't believe that I need to make X number of dollars to be happy. But if I lost my job and became poor tomorrow, that belief would seriously be put to the test. I might think that I believe that I would be faithful to my wife, even if this, that, or the other happened. But if I was ever in that situation, I would discover what my core belief actually is. And we all, we never, the, the key thing is we violate our public beliefs all the time. We violate our private beliefs a lot more than most of us care to admit. We never validate, we never, we never violate our core beliefs. So I believe that gravity is real. And then if I walk off the roof of my house, I will die. Kind of two story house on a hill. I will never violate that. Never. I'm not tempted to. I'm not up there just thinking, I don't know if I really believe these scientists and feel like they have an agenda. And I read Foucault and like bio stuff and power. I don't know if I really believe this. I'm really tempted to walk. I, I'm not even tempted. I don't even think about it because my core belief is gravity is real. And if I walk off the roof of my house, I'll die. So our behavior, such as sin in the language of the New Testament, is a great indicator of what we actually believe. Okay, let's. Um, we're getting near the end of our time, but let's back up a little bit to the mental map thing a little bit because uh, the way you described it is fantastic. Here's my struggle. I feel like depending on what Christian community you're a part of or what Christian leader you might be following, there's there's kind of different levels of mapping that's going on. So I don't know if I've got this thought out well enough. For example, on a very progressive in a very progressive Christian community, they may well have just ad adapted or adopted the mental map given to us by our secular culture, and they just throw a little Jesus into it, right? Right. On the other extreme, in like a highly fundamentalist environment, they're trying to convey what they believe to be a hyper, hyper detailed biblical map of the world to the point where they will give you instructions on the biblical way to date, the biblical way to manage your money, the biblical way to, I mean, everything is wrapped out. So there's no ambiguities whatsoever. Whereas some in my faith, there seems to be a mental map that I get from really saturating my mind and imagination in, in the scriptures and in prayer. Yes. Yes. But it doesn't always drill down to the minutia of life to know in every moment exactly what I'm supposed to do. So it doesn't, it doesn't do tell me how that, as a Christian I should handle social media, you know, right. I mean, it can give me basic principles, but I don't know if I should even be on this cesspool of human iniquity. Yeah. And so, it I mean, that's where the, the, that. the maps are helpful, but at some point you need wisdom Yes, and not just say, okay, here's the rule. I've got the map. I'm going to follow it. Wisdom. We need wisdom and we need a holy imagination. Like I'm sure you've read, um, N.T. Wright's five-act play thing. This isn't pragmatic, but it's a great word picture. Right. You know, the common uh, or more recent Protestant summary of the Library of Scripture is creation, fall, redemption, new creation, which is good. Uh, but he points out that, you know, that's basically ignoring most of the Old Testament. <laughs> and Israel has little to nothing to say to that. And Jesus was a Jewish rabbi and the Jewish Messiah. So he has a five-act, you know, kind of schema. And it's creation fall, Israel, Jesus, church, or new creation. And, you know, he's British, like upper crust British. So he goes to plays, as many of us Americans don't, unless we're from New York or from, from old money. But he has this analogy of how it's like a five-act play. And we live, you know, where we plot ourselves in that story, in that five-act play, we live in act five in between the church and the new creation between Jesus, you know, first resurrection and our resurrection. And he writes about how imagine if it's like that play has the, has seen act five, scene one, the book of acts in the new Testament. And it has the final scene revelation 21 and 22. So we know how act five begins and we know how it ends, but we're missing the middle and we're improv actors in his analogy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So improv actors, and he's like, they don't get to make up whatever they want. They have to live in the storyline as it's come to them. They have to live in the contours. They have to play their role. They have to be their character. And they can't end it. They can't take it wherever they want, as my progressive friends would not like this analogy. It's, it has a telos, and it is Revelation 21, 22, the return of Jesus to rule and to reign. But there is a, a holy imagination and a, a creativity that is built into this stage of the church where we we know where we come from we know where we're going there are contours there are there are guidelines but we need a kind of holy imagination to play our part well so i know that's not pragmatic but it's a fun analogy no i think it's a beautiful analogy and it's a perfect one because the improv idea gives us some agency right yes we 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 aren't just these robots on some pre-programmed uh predetermined narrative that we have no say over, which is what I think a lot of fundamentalism kind of wants to impose on us. Yeah. Um, and don't, don't you think that's because agency is both exciting, but it's also anxiety producing? Yes, exactly. So, you know, that's why we have the most anxious generation in American history, because they also have more agency than any generation in American history. And there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. Yes. And so I think part of the, like the most gracious way when I, and I, you probably spend way more time with American fundamentalists or, con, you know, super conservative Christians or far right Christians. I, it's so not, I live in Portland. I just, I, I know like three of those people and they're, none of them are in Portland. They're like distant family members. And every time I'm around them, it's just like my eyes bulge. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's a whole other world. Um, but when I, I'll get angry, I'll get worked up. I'll get really judgmental. And then I'll just try to, I think the most gracious interpretation is this is a fear coping mechanism. Exactly. All the crazy rapture stuff that I grew up with, I think it was a fear coping mechanism for Christians living through the 60s and all of the social unrest. And I think right now we're living through another time of social unrest. So of course, there's another massive grab for order and control to try to tamp down people's anxiety. Unfortunately, it's a toxic way to deal with your anxiety. Yeah, I agree. And and but don't you think living in Portland, which is more of a progressive uh, utopia uh, or <laughs> First dystopia, off, it's not more of a progressive? It's as far left about as you can go, and it is not utopia. Dystopia <laughs> would be a much <laughs> much more accurate label. But don't, with really don't you good, think that, that dystopia with that, great coffee? Don't you think that anxiety in this anxious generation is also looking for that certainty? in a sort of progressive fundamentalism and absolutism on the left as well? Oh, 100%. I mean, cue Dave Chappelle right now and all that controversy. Yes. I mean, this, I don't know if we, sh we should probably not put this on the internet, Sky. I, I grew up in conservative evangelicalism, not the like dregs of the worst, you know, it was not racist. It was not none of that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, a, a mild form of, of the bad, uh, what do you call it? The, the big hairy ball or whatever, a mild form of that. And I remember, you know, in that culture, it was not the norm of the churches I was a part of, thank God. But I remember you'd meet people that were just like the, the, the Simpsons old church lady, just these mean kind of bigoted, angry, judgmental, small-minded, intolerant, critical, aggressive kind of people. And it was never the timber of the church, but those people were kind of on the margins. And I just remember, sure. you know, my dad was a pastor. And even when I was a young pastor, I would have to interface with some of these people uh, when I was first working at a suburban megachurch. And it was, you know, it was really disheartening. I don't know any people like that anymore, but I'm telling you, the meanest people I know, the most intolerant, honestly, the most ignorant people I like, and, that, and that's too mean, uh, very intellectually closed minded and not open to other nuanced, thoughtful intelligence, counter arguments, people that you can't question, you can't doubt, they shove dogma down your throat. And if you dare to even question a little chink in it will literally shame you and excommunicate you are young, entirely white, millennial progressives. Hence, there you go. I mean, not even yeah. in question. So that probably shouldn't go on the internet. But I, again, the most gracious interpretation is, you know, helicopter parenting, there's a New York study that dated helicopter parenting, the beginning of it to 1990. 
Since 1990, there has been an 80% rise in anxiety amongst millennials and Gen Z. 80%. Yeah, this is, um, was it Lukoff and um, what's his name? I'm blanking on uh, Jonathan Haidt, right? They did their, oh, their yes. the coddling of the American coddling mind. The American mind. All... Yes, what a yeah, book. Yeah, their stuff is great. Okay, uh, John Mark, two things. First of all, we got to wrap up this. And I want everybody to remember your new book, Live No Lies, Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies That Sabotage Your Peace. If, if we didn't explicitly say this, but the three enemies that are the core of this book are the devil, the flesh, and the world, uh, rooted in those ancient monastic traditions. And it's not what people think. I don't want you to assume that this is some kind of weird tirade about spiritual warfare as it's been popularly defined. It's a super thoughtful book, as all of your works are. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, so thanks for being with us. Would you be willing to stick around for 10 minutes more to do a bonus conversation for our Patreon folks? Yeah. Heck yeah. But just heck as yeah. long as the listeners know, Sky Tani was once the editor of my books. Book, singular, sadly. It was it was just too good to ever repeat. Remember that? You edited yeah, one I, book? Yeah, I edited one book and then I was out. All done. I know. But I so, think I have but all I, your books I, I on I still got shelf. a podcast interview in, so I'll, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> no longer my editor. <laughs> But no. still my digital faraway friend. No, no, no. Well, anyway, John Mark, thank you so much uh, for being with respect. us. Um, for those great of you who are Patreon. Guy, I'm really grateful. May your tribe increase. Thank you. Uh, for those who are Patreon supporters, stick around or go to our Patreon page and you will get a uh, brief bonus conversation with John Mark. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more. 